And good morning, Rouge Community Bible Church and those listening at various stations around the church property and, uh, and who knows where around the world. And I get more comments each week uh, from people uh, tuning in and listening to the Word of God each and every week. So God bless you. Thank you for being here. And uh, I want to start off this morning with prayer. And we're going to pray for Sister Jackie Cobble. I announced last week that she's gone on hospice and she's about ready to meet Jesus. And she's 87 years old and she is, she's been ready for three years. She's been bedridden for a long time. And uh, so been in contact with her family, her daughters, and we're uh, praying for Jackie Cobble today. And then we're also rejoicing in the Lord for Sister Lucy Maddox, who's uh, been in the hospital for almost two weeks now, but she's in her own room, sitting up, talking. She sounds like Lucy, she laughs like Lucy and we're loving everything about it. And she said she might have two more weeks in the hospital. So uh, it was a really serious situation that she had, but uh, it looks like she's uh, coming out okay. So we rejoice in that. So let's uh, pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can come and worship you on this beautiful summer morning. And we uh, thank you it's Communion Sunday. And we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we lift up Jackie Cobble to you and thank you for her life of dedication and service to you in so many ways and so well known in this valley for her many years. And Lord, she's ready to meet you and we feel like that might be coming soon. Lord, give her every peace and comfort in this, these last weeks. Be with her family, be with Don, her husband. And Lord, we just commit her to you and we rejoice at her prospective home going to heaven. Lord, we thank you for being with Lucy Maddox and getting her through this very difficult and trying time with Danny and his two daughters. And Lord, we thank you that she's sitting up, talking, laughing, and loving again. And we just pray for her recovery, that she could be back with us soon, keep her spirits high. And Father, we just pray for each one of us that you'd keep us safe, uh, keep us steady, keep our faith strong, help us to have the long game in view, to persevere, to never give up, because we know what's on the other side of this. It's heaven and you. And so help us to get through our lives with all the trials and difficulties that come our way. And may we do it with you in our life. Father, we just commit ourselves to you in this service and we ask it in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's take our song sheets and in preparation for communion, we're gonna sing Calvary Covers It All. And I want you to get your little communion cup out and start fiddling with that and get the lid off and get your little wafer out and uh, that's going to be coming up next and uh, so let's sing Calvary Covers It All. <clears throat> Far dearer than all that the world can be in part was the message that came to my heart how that Jesus alone for my sin did atone, and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its sin and stain, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers it all. The stripes that he bore, and the thorns that he wore, told his mercy and love evermore. And my heart bowed in shame, as I called on his name and Calvary covers it all Calvary covers it all my past with its sin and stain my guilt and 
Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers it all. In preparation for communion this morning, I want to share with you some verses from last week's passage in our sermon, Hebrews 7, 26 through 28. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he sacrificed and offered himself. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ for offering himself one time for all time, because it was effective for all people who claim the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you've claimed Jesus Christ's sacrifice for you, you've personalized it, you've confessed your sins, you've asked him in to come into your heart, you're a child of God, you've been born again. If you have that kind of relationship with Christ, he invites you to share in this communion together, to do this in remembrance of him and what he did for us so long ago. Let's bow our head in prayer and ask the Lord and thank him for these elements before we take them. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you're a better high priest. You're our great high priest. You're our mega high priest. We thank you that you offered yourself for all of us once for all and that it was effective. We claim it. We invite you into our heart and life. We want to remember you today, and we thank you for your body which was broken for us. We thank you for the blood that you shed in atonement for our sins. We owe everything to you, and we come and worship and thank you this morning, and we ask it in Christ's name, amen. If you'll take your wafer, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then if you'll take the cup. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord Jesus for what he's done for us today. Our children's sermon this morning is going to be uh, given to us by Vicki Prose. So Vicki will have you come up and uh, share the children's sermon with us. is called Deeply Rooted. And our key verse that goes with our lesson today is found in Hebrews 12, 15. And it says, see to it that no root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by it many become defiled and unclean. I have to move some things here. So we're gonna define some words before we get started. And we're going to define the word bitterness. And the word bitterness means, it can mean anger, resentment, and unhappy. The word root means to take deeply and firmly a hold. Everyone has had a time, I know we've all had a time, when we've had our feelings hurt, we things have made us feel bad about ourselves, and or somebody's bullied you. It may have caused you to be bitter. When we allow those bitter feelings, and that's called bitterness, to stay in us, they grow stronger as they take hold of us, making it harder to get rid of those deep feelings. So see this little baby plant here? It's a little tiny one. When someone first makes us upset and we start to feel bitterness, it goes inside of us and it takes a hold like the roots of this plant. See those roots? 
If we do nothing about these feelings, they stay and they grow until they have roots as big as this tree. The roots on this little plant are not too far under the surface, but this older tree's roots go very, very deep. God wants us to be free of all bitterness. He wants us to recognize and bring those feelings to him before those roots take a hold like this tree. He tells us to forgive those that hurt us so we will be happier and free. If we acknowledge this bitterness and confess it to Jesus, the roots of anger can be removed. If we tried to dig up this older tree, it wouldn't be very easy, would it? Those things go very, very deep. Digging up the older tree would be more difficult because the roots are very big. Bitterness in the same way, if we allow it to take root in our hearts, it can go down deep and be very hard to get rid of. So we need to keep a sharp eye out for roots that start to take a hold. We need to take our shovel, which is the word of God in prayer, and dig them out before they go so deep that the work becomes laborious and very hard to remove. So how do we recognize in our hearts if we have bitterness? One way is if you have the desire to get even or get revenge against somebody, we can tell right away that bitterness has taken a hold. So don't let any root of bitterness spring up to cause you trouble and to become, make you become defeated or destroyed by it. We bring it to Jesus and ask him to help you. He will set you free from the slave of bitterness. Now Dan Kay is going to come and do our special music this morning, Dan. Evil angel on my shoulder, you sure do know your stuff. You start off with just a little, till I just can't get enough. Well, that first taste of whiskey burnt your tongue. That first taste of whiskey burnt your tongue But you had to go and have another That first taste of whiskey burnt your tongue Evil angel on my shoulder You sure do know your stuff you start off with just a little Till I just can't get enough Well, that first cigarette burned your eyes <laughs> That first cigarette burnt your eyes But you had to go and light another that first cigarette Oh, don't you remember That first cigarette Burned your eyes Evil angel On your shoulder You sure do know your stuff You start off With just a little 
Child, I just can't get enough Well, that first cheating love ain't you a shame Well, that first cheating love made you a shame But you had to go and have another That first cheating love Oh, don't you remember that first cheating love made you a shame? Evil angel on your shoulder, you sure do have a way. First you start off with just a little, then you just the way evil angel on my shoulder you sure do know your stuff first you start off with just a little then you just can't get enough hell I just can't Get enough. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dan. That's that that's a good song. That's good. <clears throat> My last five years in the Army, I uh, went on a deployment to Iraq for a year with the Oregon Army National Guard, and our brigade commander of 3,500 men and women in Iraq was Dan Hokanson, and he grew up in Happy Camp, California, went to school there, Lou, Lou played high school basketball against him. They're the same age, down in Dunsmuir, and uh, we, I got to know him pretty well, and we bonded. And then uh, he got promoted to one-star general when we got back. He was a colonel in Iraq uh, in 2010. And he got promoted to one-star general. And then he got promoted to two-star general. And I prayed for his uh, promotion ceremony. He was back in D.C. when he got his first star. He was in Oregon when he got his second star. And he became the adjutant general, which is the head of all of the Oregon Army National Guard, about eight to 9,000 soldiers. And uh, then I retired in 2014, and I've got his speed dial in my phone today, and it says Hokanson. I haven't bothered the man. I don't know if he even remembers me. And a year ago, I was out in my shop, and my phone rang, and I got it out, and it said Hokanson. He's a three-star general in Washington, D.C., and he's the head of all of the National Guard, all 54 states and territories. And I prayed at his three-star. He asked me to pray at his three-star promotion in Portland. I drove all the way up to Portland just for that, prayed, came home. Well, he called me, and I said, what are you doing calling me, and you have the same phone number? <laughs> and he said, I'm stuck in traffic in D.C., and I was going through my contact list, and I just saw your name and called you up, say hi. So we chatted just for a little bit, you know, and he's so warm and he said, Ron, he's always told me this. He says, if I ever get a chance, I wanna to come to your church. He's a devout Catholic, wonderful man. Uh, his brother lives in Central Point. And he, I, I believe him, he might show up one day. Well, a year went by and I got a, a message from him, text message. Hokinson, Ron, could I get a good email address for you? Dan H. I wrote him back my email address. I haven't heard from him, but I'm wondering what it's about. <laughs> I wonder what he's going to say. Well, it's been announced that he is going to be a four-star general. The top you can go. He's going to be on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, representing the National Guard, along with the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force. And I am guessing he might want me to pray for his promotion ceremony. 
but I don't know where that would be or when. Maybe not, maybe it's just an invitation. But uh, to know somebody like that, that remembers you and you have a relationship with, uh, pretty amazing. And boy, to be at that top level, you have to have the top level, top secret security clearances to know the most, uh, the most uh, inside secrets of our nation. And uh, we're proud to uh, claim him as Oregon's own and that he's gone. He's the highest ranking, I'm sure, officer ever from Oregon in the history of our nation to make that kind of rank. But uh, it just reminds me that in a way, I want you to know, you might not have Dan Hokanson in your contact list, and he might not message you, but you got somebody with a top secret security clearance that has access to God, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he's got more than four stars, and he wants to talk to you. He wants to send you an instant message. He wants to call you up, how you doing? And you can take all of your concerns to him because he has access to heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Isn't that great to know that Jesus has you on his speed dial? And if you know him as your savior, as, uh, your savior if you have that kind of relationship with him. And it's just unbelievable the access that we have as Christians. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 8 as we begin a new chapter in our study. And if you're tired of the word superior or better, you better get used to it because it's going to continue. And this is the real theme of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is a superior way. He is a better covenant. He is a better high priest. He's superior in every way. And hence, the Old Testament has become the law and the priesthood has become null and void. It has been superseded and surpassed by something greater, Jesus Christ, the new covenant. The Old Testament is still good. We have many things to learn from the Old Testament. I love to preach from the Old Testament. But only Jesus Christ will save you. And he is a better and superior way the Old Testament's been nailed to the cross, but Jesus has opened up for us a new and better way, and he has torn the veil, keeping us out of the Holy of Holies, the localized presence of God, and now we can go and we can have direct access to heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why when we pray, we say we pray this in your name, amen, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because if it wasn't for him, our Father would not hear us, and He is the new and better way. In these just five verses this morning, to start chapter 8, we're going to see that the new covenant, the new testament of grace, has a better high priest than the Old Testament, has a better place, heaven, versus the temple and tabernacle in the Old Testament, and better promises that are eternal, over the Old Covenant. So when we look at verse 1, it starts out, the point of what we are saying is this. I want you to know as a preacher, for 40 years, I've wrestled with this idea. What's the point of my sermon? What is the big idea? This is how I was trained in seminary. And this might help you as a sermon listener in the pew or the car, <laughs> or your couch, or recliner at home, that we're to ask two questions about our sermon. What is it talking about, and what is it saying about it? What are we talking about? A better covenant. What is it saying about a better covenant? A better high priest, a better place, a better promise. And then you have the outline for your sermon. So if you can ask and answer those two questions, what am I talking about? Baking a cake. What is it saying about it? Flour, water, sugar, chocolate, and stir, and bake. 
Then you have the outline of your talk. And so here it's saying the point, that, and he's summarizing all of last chapter, chapter 7, about Melchizedek being a better high priest. After the order of Melchizedek, this mysterious Old Testament figure. So he's pausing and giving us as readers and listeners a chance to breathe. The point of what I'm saying is the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. This is what I've been saying all of chapter 7. And he says, let me continue to make this point. The word point here means in Greek, head, kephale, the head. This is the main thing I'm talking about. This is the main point. This is the head, the title of the sermon. This is the main thought. And the body, the body of the sermon will unfold from the head in a better priest, a better place, and better promises. There's a, another word that you may have heard, and it's called leitmotif. I know that's kind of a foreign word to us. But in music, and I'll take John Williams for example, uh, and let me give you a late motif of one of his famous songs. Bum bum ba bum bum ba bum bum ba bum 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 ba bum 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 ba bum. You know you know what that movie is? Isn't that the Darth Vader melody there? And all the way through the movie, you're going to hear. Boom, 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 boom. That's the theme. That's the late motif. That's the head. That's the thing that ties it all together. So I hope that during my sermons, you're going to hear my late motif. It's better. It's superior. It's better. It's superior. It's better. It's superior. That'll help you as a sermon listener. And you should sit down in the pew each Sunday and go, what is his big idea? What's the one big thing he's trying to say? And I hope I repeat it again and again and again. And what is he saying about it? That's usually the sub points under that sermon. Well, here it is right here. The point of what I'm saying, here's the big idea, listeners, right in the Bible. I'm saying that Jesus is superior. The New Testament is superior to, it's better than the Old Covenant. It's the new covenant in my blood, and we celebrated that this morning. Well, in the rest of verse 1 and 2, we're going to see that Jesus has become the better high priest. The new covenant has a better high priest than the Old Testament, and boy, have we hammered that in chapter 7. Those Old Testament high priests came and went. They sacrificed every day, first for their sins and then the sins of the nation. They died and their sons took their place and it went on for 1,500 years. And the reason they had to keep repeating it and keep having high priests, it didn't work. It was not successful. It was not efficacious or effective. And so Jesus came and died once for all because it worked. He only died once, not day after day. Hebrews goes on to say that. Uh, I'm going to keep repeating this in chapter 9 of Hebrews and chapter 10. It keeps on going, this theme. He is our great mega high priest, and he was effective. Let's look at the rest of 1 and verse 2. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. So this great mega high priest does exist. There is a new and better way. There is one that can save your soul. There is such an ideal to aspire to, and it's Jesus Christ. This high priest had adequacy he is suitable for us in every way. I read in one of my commentaries and I wrote it down in my outline. This is not mere idealism. This is reality now. It's not I wish we had one like this. I wish we had an ideal savior. I wish there could be somebody that would relate to me and be suitable to me. We do have such a high priest. He was tempted in every way that we were. He came down and was born in Bethlehem. 
He struggled as a child. He was tempted in all points that we were, yet without sin. He was falsely accused. He had stress in his life. He got tired. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He had to deal with people and 12 crazy apostles. Some of them were big time trouble. He had to deal with betrayal with Judas. He was falsely accused and tried, beaten, abused, and voluntarily gave up his life only to rise from the dead and be our savior for all time. So we do have one who's adequate and that he is suitable in every way. And that's what we thank him for and it's a reality right now for any one of you that want to avail yourself of him. It also says that he sat down at the right hand of the throne. Hebrews makes a point that the priest had to stand all day, every day to do their work. They were busy. They had to stand up because they were busy. A lot of people have stand-up desks today. I remember Dan Hokinson. He got a stand-up desk in the headquarters building at the military department in Salem. And I went in there, and this desk is really cool. It's, power, it's, it's got a remote control, and you can raise it up, and he can stand and work. This guy is fit as a fiddle. He set a record at one of the Army bases for running the two miles in nine minutes. This guy can run like a deer. But he's 58, and he's starting to get gray hair, so I don't know if he can run like a deer anymore. But boy, he is fit. And he probably ran it with combat boots on, just to make it a little more challenging. But here's the stand-up desk, and then if he wants to sit down, it lowers it down to regular height. And they do that to burn calories, to stay fit. And here these high priests stood every day working, slaughtering animals over and over and over again. Their work was never done. And Hebrews 10, 11, and 12 said, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. He stands and performs his religious duties. You might not realize it, but from uh, 9 o'clock till usually 12.30, I'm standing. I'm tired when I go home. I've been standing three and a half hours. Just a small little window into what an Old Testament priest did. And when you stand, you get tired. And here it says in Hebrews 10, 11, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. It didn't work. But when the high priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Where is Jesus today seated at the right hand of God? Why? His work is finished. He sacrificed sin once for all, 2,000 years ago on Calvary, and now he's seated, his work is completed, and it's finished. And that's what he said on the cross, it is finished, because it was effective. And so the finished work of Christ, it was completed and successful. He is seated at the right hand, and here's the next phrase, of the throne of the majesty of heaven. And here we have this special word, majesty, to heighten the word, uh, how great God is. This adjective of almost a, a name for God, the majesty, the majesty of heaven, God the Father. And he's seated on a throne, and Jesus is seated on a throne next to him, waiting for all of his enemies to become his footstool. Now this is the amazing thing. As high priest, he sacrificed himself as the high priest, and I've gone into this in detail before, but you could never hold both offices in the Bible. You couldn't be both the king and the priest. That's why Melchizedek is so interesting, because he was both king and priest at the same time. And Jesus serves after the order of Melchizedek. It was never permitted. David had got in trouble. Saul got in trouble and lost his kingdom because Saul as the king sacrificed animals when Samuel the priest was away. And God took the kingdom from him for holding both offices. And here Jesus is now seated on a throne, king, 
and he's the King of kings and Lord of lords in the book of Revelation, and he's also our high priest, and his work is finished. And so here we see the finished work of Christ. One interesting side note, there's only one place in the Bible where we read that Jesus stands in heaven. And when Stephen, the first Christian martyr in Acts chapter 7, was stoned to death for his faith, when Stephen's soul and spirit went to heaven, Jesus stood to receive Stephen into heaven. My dad speculated, I wonder if Jesus stands when every believer enters into heaven and says, welcome. Boy, I tell you, what a welcome it will be to see our Savior face to face one day and to be welcomed personally by him into heaven as he welcomes believers who enter into glory. Reading in verse 2, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. So today he is serving in the true tabernacle in heaven. Now this is an interesting thing, and we're going to get this a little bit later this morning, that Moses' instructions on Mount Sinai were to build a tabernacle. And he, he was given a vision of the true one in heaven. And it says that Moses was to build the tabernacle according to the pattern he saw in heaven. Man, if you had a vision or a dream or God showed you something and he said, I want you to build this, I would hope I'd have a pencil and paper in my hand to take some notes down. Better, better than that, a digital camera. <laughs> if you want me to build this, I need to see a picture of it. And Moses, through God's help, committed what he saw in heaven and he replicated it here on earth in the tabernacle and eventually the temple. Well, what we read about here, and look at verse 2 again. Jesus serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up by the Lord, not by man. After reading, and I've talked much about this, The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser. I encourage you to get that book if you want to sink your teeth into that. But he talks about this concept of sacred space where we can meet God. The first sacred space is the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in the Garden of Eden. But because of their sin, they were kicked out of that sacred space because God's holy and man's sin and had to leave that sacred environment. They lost their security clearance because of sin and no longer able to enter into that sacred space. And then Mount Sinai became sacred space. And only Moses was allowed on top of that mountain. They built a fence around the mountain to keep the sinful people away from the mountain or they would be killed because God dwelled on Mount Sinai. It was sacred space like the Garden of Eden. And he gave Moses the instructions, the Ten Commandments, the law, the 613 precepts and commands, and the pattern to build the tabernacle, which was the portable tent they carried for 40 years through the wilderness and carried it into Israel, where they planted it, if you will, at Shiloh in central Israel in the mountains. And there it existed for 400 years, that tent, that tabernacle. The Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, the brazen altar, the, the laver, the, the sea, uh, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the golden candlestick. And then David and his son built the temple and they moved the pieces and to a permanent location in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple. And it only lasted 350 years, less time than the tabernacle. And that sacred space was burnt to the ground by Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian. Then they rebuilt that temple under Ezra, Zerubbabel, and Nehemiah. And they rebuilt that temple, and it lasted. And then Herod the Great came along just before Christ's birth, and he basically tore that one down and built one that was on steroids. It was huge. 
Herod's temple, so much bigger. There's a picture right outside this door on the wall. You look at the size of all those temples. And there's Herod's great temple. And that's the one that Jesus was at while he was on earth. And here the present ministry of Christ. He serves in the heavenly sacred space where we're all going to be one day. By the way, the only decorations that were allowed in the tabernacle and the temple were Garden of Eden themes. You look on that chart out there. It's all the beautiful flora and fauna and leaves of, uh, of uh, the Garden of Eden as pictured. And you remember, thou shalt have no graven image before me. They were not allowed to depict objects and things except for the Garden of Eden themes. And they put that inside the temple. And guess what heaven's going to be like? It's going to be like the Garden of Eden, the new paradise. The Bible begins and ends the same way. It begins with paradise and it ends with paradise. It begins with sacred space. Sin kicked us out of that sacred space. And then it ends with sacred space where we'll live with God forever in the Garden of Eden called heaven. And here we see that Jesus Christ serves in the true sanctuary, the one that Moses patterned the tabernacle and temple off of, the true one in heaven. And what does Jesus do there? Well, I'll tell you one thing he doesn't do. He doesn't sacrifice. It's all been done. Well, what does Jesus do in heaven? Well, first of all, he's our mediator. He mediates and stands between us and God. He also prays for us. He's an intercessor. You're to take all of your needs and give them to Jesus, and he will intercede for you. He will pray for you. And what else does Jesus do? He's our defense attorney when we're accused by Satan. And he will defend us and say, like with Job, and he will show, it, show that we are innocent because he has saved us from all of our sins. So Jesus' present ministry is in heaven at the true tabernacle, at the right hand of his Father, praying for us, defending for us. He's our mediator. He's our sponsor. And you can call him on your speed dial anytime you want, and you can get the Pentagon. And he's got all the power and authority in the world. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, we have a better high priest, one that was effective, one that is in heaven today at the true tabernacle, the true te temple. Now in verses 3 through 5, we're going to see that not only do we have a better high priest, we have a better place. And we read in verse 3, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. And so every high priest had to do his work. He was appointed, this was his job, to offer sacrifices on his own behalf first, and then on behalf of the people. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. Well, what did Jesus offer? His life, his body, his blood. He gave up himself as a sacrifice to God. I want to ask you, you need something to offer him. What are you going to offer? What are you going to give God? So many people say, oh, all the preacher does is talk about money. All, the, all they talk about at church is money. They just want my money. I tell people, God doesn't need your money. He doesn't even want your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth of every mine. God is not poor that he needs your help or your money. What does the New Testament tell us? Before you put anything in the offering plate, he says, I want you to give yourself first. Give yourself. I wish we had a bigger offering basket where you could get in it. Like, wouldn't the ushers drag you down the aisle? Well, he gave himself first. Maybe I should build a bigger box with a big slot. And you could just crawl right through that slot and give yourself first to God. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you offer yourselves, offer yourself 
as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. God doesn't want your money. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your devotion. He wants your affection. And if he gets that, he's got everything. He's got all of you. Money's not going to be a problem. You're not going to be a stingy giver. You're going to be a liberal giver who laughs hilariously, Corinthians says. Give joyfully. And you're going to want to do it. And you're going to, it's going to make you feel good because you're supporting the work of God who saved you. And so the logical answer is that we need to have something to offer him because Christ offered for us. We need to reciprocate. If he gave himself, I need to give myself. And I need to fully commit myself to him. Verse 4. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. Well, there's no need for Christ to come back to earth. There are, and in the Old Testament, there were many priests who were already assigned the task to do all those things. On earth, Christ could be the king, but he could not be a priest. He wasn't of the tribe of Levi. Christ, in a sense, was not qualified, according to the Jewish law, to be a priest. He was from the wrong tribe. As it turned out, the kings in the Davidic kingdom came from the line of David. They, he was from the tribe of Judah. And what was the capital of Judah where they paid their taxes? Bethlehem. That's why Joseph and Mary went there. That's why Jesus was born in the city of David, Bethlehem. And so Christ was not a Levi, but since he was appointed to be high priest after the order of Melchizedek, not of Levi, Christ was qualified to serve in both capacities. So we know that Christ can be our high priest in heaven, not on earth, after the order of Melchizedek, this shows that the Levitical system was still functioning at the time of the writing prior to the temple's destruction in 70 AD. So let's look at that verse again and let me make this logical point here. They serve at a sanctuary, and notice they serve currently, whenever they wrote the book of Hebrews, they serve, and I'm going to add the word currently, at the sanctuary that is a copy of the shadow of what is in heaven. And all the commentators say this helps us to date the writing of the book of Hebrews. It was before 70 A.D., which was some 28 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. Because the temple, Herod's great giant temple, was completely destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D., and it was burned to the ground. And so this book was probably written in the 70s A.D., or in the 60s, prior to 70 A.D., and it was still going on. They were still going through the, the ritual of the Old Testament. And the author's going, it's over. It was over 28 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. And he's writing to Jewish people, get over the Old Testament. Get on to the new. The old has passed away. The new has come. And let's get current in your faith. Because it could never save you. And so here was the answer given by Christ. In verse 5, they serve, the Levitical priests, the priests of the day of the writing of the book, they serve in a sanctuary, Herod's temple in Jerusalem. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Remember I told you Moses went up to the sacred place on Mount Sinai? He alone was permitted to go up there. He stayed up there 40 days and 40 nights. That's one of the reasons that Mount Sinai is one of the most popular Christian pilgrimage sites in the world. There are, I don't know if during coronavirus, but there are a thousand Christians every day from around the world in 40 tour buses that drive to one of the most remote places in the world, the tip of the Sinai Peninsula at 5,000 feet elevation, and they climb that mountain because it's sacred space. That's where God met with Moses. And it's a sight to behold. I've climbed that mountain 13 times, and it's special. And there's where God met with Moses and showed him a pattern 
through a vision of the true one in heaven. And Moses wrote it down in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, and they made the replica that we see in the tabernacle and temple on earth. In southern Israel in the desert, when you go on a tour to Israel, they stop by this one place, and they have set up a replica of the tabernacle out of there in the desert. And it's three-dimensional, it's to scale, and you can walk around and see it all, and it really makes it come alive. And, uh, but boy, it's not even close to the real one in heaven. It's a copy, it's a pattern. And it's a pretty bad pattern, if I do say so myself. I've been there, and I wish they could have done a little bit better job, but it was a good attempt to see the scale of uh, the tabernacle. And so here we see that the, the priest currently in the, in the 60s AD served at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of the one that was in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. God showed him a pattern. He showed him the blueprints. I want you to make as accurately as you can, a copy of the one that is in heaven. Well, today, we believe that there is that true tabernacle in heaven. But we know that in heaven, there's going to be no temple. The book of Revelation says that there's no temple in heaven. Revelation 21, 22, I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. But earlier in Revelation, it says, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. In Revelation 8, 3, another angel who had a golden censer. In Revelation 4, And before the throne there looked like what was the sea of glass, which is a replica of the brazen laver which was, I think, if I remember right, 22 foot across. It held tens of thousands of gallons of water. It was a, a giant baptistry. It was a giant pool of water called the Golden Sea, and here the sea of glass in the temple, and here we read about it in Revelation. So even though there wasn't a temple, there were remembrances and replicas of some of these things that still are in heaven, while there's not a temple to house it because God and Jesus are the temple. They are the sacred space where you meet them. And so there were many illusions still of the temple and tabernacle in heaven. Paul, like Moses, got to go to a sacred space. Paul said, I was permitted, whether in the body or in the spirit, I do not know, but I was taken to the third heaven we believe the first heaven would be our atmosphere where the birds fly and there's air. The second heaven would be space where our astronauts go and the galaxies that we can see with telescopes. But the third heaven is beyond all of that. It is the abode and dwelling of God. And Paul got to go there in a vision. Whether in body or vision, he did not know. But what he said, what he saw there, he was not permitted to tell or talk about. And he was overwhelmed. You know, when you have a secret, top secret security clearance like Dan Hokanson, he knows things that he's not permitted to tell about. He's seen things, he knows things that you are not permitted to know about. Every army officer and NCO has to have a secret clearance. That's what I held for my 26 years in the National Guard. I had a secret clearance. And the FBI comes out they ask you all kinds of questions. They do all the background checks. They really work you over. But almost everyone in the military needs to have a secret clearance. But if you're of such rank and position, you're required to have a top secret. That's a whole nother level that I never achieved. I could have gone for it, but it would have taken several years to get a top secret clearance. And then you can see and look at documents and know things that people with secret clearances can't have. In our armory in Ashland, where our battalion commander uh, has his office, there's a special room that only he has a key to. And in there are some electronic communication devices 
that carry top secret classified information and only he who has the top secret clearance has the right to go in that room, no one else. And here we see that Paul got to go into that sacred space and he's not permitted to tell. Moses had a vision of heaven and he built what he saw. You know, today we're living in the time of shadows and images. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, Now we see in a glass darkly. When I was in Corinth, where this book was written, 1 Corinthians, I went to a museum, and there was a mirror, a hand that a lady would use. You know, just the typical little hand mirror. And it was 2,000 years old, back when Paul wrote this. And it was made of bronze. And in the museum, it wasn't polished. It had become tarnished. And I don't even know if you could call it a mirror. But I know that the curator of the museum said they would polish these highly. And you could see your reflection in it. Not as good as our mirrors today. But you could see in it. And what does Paul write? Now we see in a glass darkly. We see kind of what it's going to be like. We see images. What we saw in the tabernacle and temple were only shadows and copies of the real one in heaven. What we see in the old covenant and the Levites and the priests were only a shadow of true sacred space in heaven. But how does that verse end up? 1 Corinthians 13, 12. But soon we'll see him face to face. Soon you and I will be invited to sacred space to dwell with God forever in heaven. And it's all because of Jesus Christ who has made the way. When he died on the cross, he tore the curtain in two. One more point before I close this morning. I was doing some outside reading for a class I hope to teach at Pacific Bible College this fall on the Pentateuch. And I was reading a chapter in a textbook on Leviticus. And it says in Leviticus that there are concentric circles to get to sacred space. And it showed that only Moses was allowed on the mountain, but the priests were allowed halfway up. And the people couldn't even enter into the fence or they would die. And all the people had to stay outside the fence. And there were layers to get to God. And in the temple, there was the outer court. There was the inner court. There was the court of women, and there was where the priest could enter. And then the priest could go in, according to their routine, in the outside, the holy place, but only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. And only Jesus has been able to go into heaven. And when Jesus went into heaven, he tore the curtain in two. He broke down the walls of these concentric circles. He said, you can come to me boldly, I don't call up Dan Hokinson and bug him. Hey, how you doing? I don't call him like that. He can call me, and I'm honored. But you can call Jesus every time, and he is, Dan Hokinson is very able, but he's not as able as Jesus Christ. <laughs> he wants to hear from you today. He wants you to bug him with your problems, your thoughts, your thinking, he wants to have a closer relationship with you than you know. You should pray to him. You should tell him how you feel in prayer. You should have a running dialogue with your Lord Jesus Christ all day. When your phone rings, you should expect to see it's Jesus. Right there. Oh, it's Jesus. Just a minute. You should talk to him. You should have a relationship. We have a better covenant a better priest. We have better promises next week. And we're going to have a better time loving God and serving him because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. If you take your song sheet, when we see Christ, won't it be great to see Christ in person, face to face? Let's all stand up as we sing this morning and close our time together. It will be
head in prayer and commit our lives to him this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you that you represent us in heaven. You're our mediator, our intercessor, our defense attorney. We thank you for your present ministry with us. Thank you for giving us your cell phone number. Thank you for saying you can call me anytime. You can message me, text me. I want to be involved in your life. I want to know about you. I want to help you. I want to sympathize with your weaknesses. Father, help us as we bravely run this race that's kind of difficult right now for our world. Help us to bravely run it, to not give up. We know we're going to win the war, but we're in a battle today. And Father, I pray that we would trust in you for each step of the way. We confess that we see shadows, but the reality is in heaven. And Lord, we long to see your face. We long to have that top secret security clearance with you in sacred space, the Garden of Eden in heaven forever and ever. Help us to bravely run our race until we see you. Strengthen us this day, knowing that we have an advocate, a better hope, a better way in heaven. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you all.